God of Jacob, the great I am, the King of angels, Son of man, voice of many waters, the song of heaven's throne, louder than the thunder, make your glory known. Let the lion roar. Hail, hail, lion of Judah. Let the lion roar. Hail, hail, lion of Judah. Let the lion roar. Hail, hail, lion of Judah. Let the lion. It is a joy to have you back on this stage with your testimony and your giftings. Carla, we get um, week after week, we have the opportunity to outwardly express what we feel inwardly as we sing back to God, the breath that he put in our lungs. We praise him 
For you as an instrumentalist, we believe that there's an anointing on your life, not just that when you play, but when you play, you usher in the presence of God. And what a joy it is to have you back on the stage. Would you bless us with a song that's part of your testimony this morning? continue into a time of worship celebrating what God has done we know more than anything more than anything we want in this life that we need God we need him and we're asking him to show up in this place in this space right now to move as he promises that he his presence will inhabit the praise of his people so let's lift up our need together for our great God this morning show me your faith Fill up this space Cause my world needs you right now My world needs you right now I can't escape For being afraid Fill me with you
eyes to show me your face. Come fill up this space. Cause my world needs you right now. My world needs you.
today? If you believe that he's faithful today, would you sing that one more time? Declare that our God is who he says that he is. Don't just look forward. Don't just look forward and hope that he's faithful. Look back and remember that he's been faithful. Look over the course of your life. Take stock of what he's done. Raise it up right now and sing. Great is your faithfulness to me. Sing great. I'll share a little secret with you. Uh, I was not supposed to speak in this series. I wasn't scheduled to speak. Um, but I dropped a lot of hints, you know. Because um, I love Jeremiah 29 11. Who doesn't love Jeremiah 29 11? What a powerful, powerful passage. And I think it's especially powerful for anybody who's going through a difficult season. You know, one of the things that is a certainty in life is that you're going to experience some downtimes. Right, My pastor that I worked for before I came here used to always say, may not be original to him, but I remember him telling me this so many times, that you're either in the middle of a struggle, you're coming out of one, or you're getting ready to go into one. Um, that is life. Life is a series of challenges. Sometimes we have high moments. We have those mountain peak moments, and they're wonderful. But then we also have those valley moments where we really go through times of struggle. And isn't it awesome that when we as God followers go through those times of struggle, we have this love letter from God to us in the scripture that is full of promises and, and things that we can, we can hold on to as anchors in the middle of that. And Jeremiah 29, 11 is one of those passages. And I think it's so helpful because is this not true? See if this rings true for you. I know it rings true for me, but I feel like when I'm going through a difficult season, it is so easy, it's human nature, I think, to triangulate out, to, to, to project what is happening right now way out into the future and say that what I'm experiencing now is not gonna change. I'm still gonna be going through this forever from now. Like it just feels like this is permanent. This is a permanent part of my life and I'm never gonna get through this, right? That word through is, is so valuable to anyone going through a valley because we're like, I just wanna get through. But there are days when we think I'm never gonna get through this. And in the middle of those feelings that are very normal human feelings, God comes and gives us this incredible passage in Jeremiah 29 where the Lord speaks and says, I know the plans I have for you. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. And we've said in previous messages that the idea of plans there, we, you know, the, through the languages and translation, translation of those languages, we, we get our word machinery from that. God says, I know the machinery I have in place for you. And the, one of the other things that we've learned already is that when God says, I know, he says, he means I know by seeing. He's like, I see the machinery working for what I have in, in store for you. But then he says, I have two gifts for you. I have the gift of a future and the gift of a hope. Well, now the gift of a future is not for today, Right? because that's the future. So that's the present that's still wrapped underneath the tree. That is a gift for tomorrow. God has given us a gift for tomorrow and that is the future that he has in mind for us. But the hope that he gives us, the second gift, that is the gift for today, right? The gift that God gives us for today is the hope of the future that he's given us. Now, in scripture, when we find the word hope, it very rarely means what you and I mean when we say, I hope this or I hope that. Like, you know, I hope that my sports team wins or I hope that it rains next week or I hope there's a lot of fried turkey at Thanksgiving. That last one is true, by the way. Um, the, we, we say, I hope, we, it's like a, I have this desire. I don't know whether it's gonna happen or not, but I desire for this to happen. That's not what this means. When you find the word hope in scripture, what it usually means is a strong confidence, 
a belief that I hold and will not be shaken from. I am confident that this is gonna happen. So God is saying, I'm giving you a future, but I'm also giving you the ability within your spirit to be confident that that future will come to pass. I'm giving you the ability, and a person who doesn't have Christ living within them, they wouldn't be able to have this. But for those of us who have the indwelling Holy Spirit, we have the ability to be confident about things that we have not seen happen yet. That is what faith is, by the way. In Hebrews, we know that the Bible tells us that faith is the substance or the evidence of things that we have not seen yet. Well, now, and that really, I loved the turn of the phrase when I was reading that as a young person, but I always struggle with, well, what substance, what evidence are we talking about? Well, here's what it means. When I am fully confident, fully confident that God is gonna do something, it changes my life, does it not? It changes my lifestyle, it changes my choices, it changes my thoughts, it changes the things that I say, it changes how I treat people around me. And those things are evidence of what has not yet happened, of what I have not seen. My life changing as a result of my confidence in God becomes evidence of what has not yet happened. And that's so important that we realize as a community of believers because we hear people all the time talk about, I'm a person of faith. Eh, Usually what they mean by that is, I have a religious affiliation. Being a person of faith means my life has been transformed by something that I believe God is going to do, by my trust in who God is. So God is saying, I I have these plans for you to give you a future uh, and a hope. If you've been with us, you know that Jeremiah 29, 11 was written to a very specific group of people and they were in the middle of a very difficult circumstance. The Israelites had had an on-again, off-again relationship with God that had been kind of very unhealthy. God had continued to bless them, continued to bless them, continued to give them instructions, and, and if they had just followed what he had said, they would have been in great shape. But unfortunately, they were super fickle, and they would go back and forth between worshiping God and worshiping what were called idols. And if you read in the Old Testament, you'll see all kinds of stuff about idolatry and worshiping idols, right? And I think in 2022 America, it's very easy for us to say, well, we don't have a problem with that. Because when we think about idolatry, if you have any background in church and you, and you know anything about the ancient world, you know that often idol, idolatry in that time, people would take uh, uh, pieces of wood and carve out a god, or they would, they would take a big piece of stone and carve out a god, and they would worship and pray to this inanimate object that they would call a god, and we recognize that that, that angered God. And it's very easy for us to say, well, that was something they did, but we don't, we don't do that in our culture. But you have to understand, creating a God can take many forms. Creating a God can take a physical form, like trying to carve out a God out of a piece of wood, or it can just be those of us who walk around and say, my God wouldn't do this, or my God wouldn't say this, or honestly, I think we're one of the most idolatrous cultures that's ever lived. Why do people create their own gods? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but I'll give you a few reasons I think are pretty clear. One is that God has rules and standards and character that does not match the rules and standards and character of us. If I got to come up with my own rules and my own standards and my own character, the truth is, if I do it all on my own without any help from God, I can just go ahead and tell you it isn't gonna match God's character, God's rules, and God's standards. And so what can happen is I can say, you know, it's very inconvenient for me that God's rules and God's standards don't match my rules and my standards. So wouldn't it be so much more convenient if I just created a God whose rules and standards did match my rules and standards? Which is where we come up with my God wouldn't say that or my God wouldn't do that. It's a convenience factor. I don't really dig what God is saying, so I'm gonna create my own God who says what I want him to say and then that way I can still be a person of faith but I don't have to deal with this disparity between what I think and what God says. Second thing is I think people create a God because they want a God that can be controlled. See, the thing about God is those of us who've come to faith and belief in the true God of the universe recognize that God is not manageable. I cannot manage God. God is the manager of the universe. But for some people, that's very difficult because they say, well, I need a God who will do what I want. And by the way, some of us, you know, as my dad used to say when I was a kid, some of us, we need to unscrew the halos a little bit and, and, and recognize that even those of us who truly are firm believers in God, we've struggled with this control issue before. How many times have we said, if God would just do what I know is the right thing to do in this situation, everything would be fine? I mean, I could just give God, have you ever wanted to just write God a letter and say, these are the things you need to do to fix my life. Just do these one one at a time, make sure you do them in order, right? 
But it is true that one of the reasons that people create their own God is because they're not, they're, they, they don't have enough control. They can't dictate what God should do because God is the person who decides what's gonna happen. And then the third thing is, I think sometimes people create gods just because they don't like the results they're getting. They don't like the results they're getting in life. This was very true for the Israelites. They didn't like the results they were getting. So long as, they, so long as God gave them the results they wanted, they would worship God. The reason they would turn around is when God stopped giving them the results they wanted, then they'd go try to figure out some other God who might. So that's why they were in trouble. And it just, it, man, it just kept being a thing. God would say, you can't do this and, and you're, you're, you have a window to repent, you have time to repent, but you can't do this anymore. And, and that is a theme in the Old Testament is God saying you have to make up your mind between creating your own gods and worshiping the true God. That is, that is a big theme throughout the Old Testament. And so God kept saying, your window's getting smaller, your window's getting smaller, your window's getting smaller to repent. When we get to Jeremiah 29, God is saying the window's closed. The time for repentance is over. You're gonna have punishment now. And he says, the way that you're gonna survive this, he says, the, the Babylonians are gonna come in, they're gonna take over Judah. Where you live, Jerusalem, the temple, all that, it's gonna be gone, you're gonna lose all that. Here's the deal, if you will surrender willingly to the Babylonians and be taken into captivity into Babylon, then you'll survive this. If you try to stay and fight this out in Judah, then you're not gonna make it. And that was exactly what happened. Some people did stay in Judah and they didn't survive it. Those who were taken into captivity in Babylon, they did. And so you need to know that Jeremiah 29, 11 is written to a group of people who have been taken into captivity uh, into Babylon. And if you were a God follower, because not everybody was that fickle, there were people that, were, that, that very much were devoted followers of the true God. For God to say, you're gonna have to go into Babylon would have been completely mind-blowing because Babylon in the scripture was an icon of a depraved culture. So you go from, from Jerusalem, the holy mount of God, to Babylon, which was the most depraved culture you could imagine, that was not anything that they would have expected God to say, that you're gonna go into captivity to these people. But not only did he say you're gonna go into captivity, he said you're gonna be there for a long time. He said when you get there, build houses, plant vineyards, plan to stay, have kids, let your kids get married, let them have kids, you're gonna have grandkids. If you hear that, you're thinking, you start calculating up the years, you think well, we're gonna be there a while. It is to those people those people who are trying to follow God but now are going into captivity, so they're going into a very difficult season of their life and God is saying, it ain't gonna be over anytime soon. It is to those people that God is saying, I know the plans I have for you. They're plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. So we gotta be careful not to just take Jeremiah 29, 11 and sprinkle it all over the place like it applies to every situation. It does not apply to every situation. Jeremiah 29, 11 is for the person who is trying to follow God and is in a tunnel that they cannot yet see the light at the end of yet. That's who Jeremiah 29, 11 is for. Now, I wanna ask you to, to, to bear with me for a minute because I, I, I want in this message, where we take a slightly different angle on this, I, I wanna fast forward 70 years to the end of the Babylonian captivity. So this is the end of this long period of time, 70 years, where they've been out of Jerusalem into captivity. Now they have a chance to go home. This is in Ezra. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord fulfilled the prophecy he had given through Jeremiah, because we've been reading in Jeremiah lately. He stirred the heart of Cyrus to put this proclamation in writing and to send it throughout his kingdom. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem, because the the temple had been torn down, which is in Judah. Any of you who are his people may go to Jerusalem and Judah to rebuild this temple of the Lord, the God of Israel who lives in Jerusalem, and may your God be with you. So after decades in captivity, you have the ruler saying, you can go home. You can go home, and not only that, I want you to rebuild the temple. That's miraculous that God stirred the heart of the king to do this. But then check this out. Wherever this Jewish remnant is found, because they were now very scattered, let their neighbors contribute toward their expenses by giving them silver and gold. I think that's pretty cool. Not only do you get to go home, but you go knock on the neighbor's door and say, give me your money. You know? Supplies for the journey, livestock, as well as a voluntary offering for the temple of God in Jerusalem. So now you have this scattered group of Jewish individuals who are now gonna make their way back home to Judah, to Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple. How amazing is that? Their journey is almost over. They've been in this journey of captivity and it's just been so hard on so many levels. Finally, they get to go home. This is what they've dreamed of for generations. But I want you to think with me for a minute 
about the fact that this is not like when the Israelites left Egypt and went to Canaan together as a group. This is not a big group traveling together. This is a bunch of people that have been displaced, each finding their own path to get back to Jerusalem. And when I mean their own path, I don't mean they took different geographic paths. I mean, it was a timing thing. Some could leave right away. Some, maybe there was a baby on the way and they had to wait until the baby was born before, before they could travel. Some, maybe there was an ill loved one who couldn't make the journey and they had to wait until that person passed away before they could make the the journey. Others, there may have been specific arrangements that had to be made. The other thing too is there was just a lot of geographic distance. So some people, even though they were in Babylon, they were closer to Jerusalem. Others were a lot farther away. So everybody's kind of making their own way back to Jerusalem. And if you think about it, some people are going to get there very quickly, right? Some people will make it there very quickly, but there are other people who want to be there just as bad. It's going to take them a little longer. The reason I set it up that way is I want to ask you, have you ever struggled? I mean, let's be real with each other. Have you ever struggled when things seem to be going right for other people, but they just don't seem to be going right yet for you? Like they're getting there, but you're not getting there yet. In the old days, we used to have testimony nights in church. Some of y'all remember that. And people would get up and tell their testimony. And testimony is basically just the story of where I was, what God did, and where I am now. Problem though is, I mean, I think we should always tell our testimony. I think those nights were wonderful, but can we just be honest, for some people in the room, it's, it's kind of a dividing feeling because on the one hand, you're really happy for them. On the other hand, it's like, well, I'm still in the, this is where I was and I'm waiting for the part where then God does something. I'm not through yet. I'm still in the middle of it. In a minute, we're gonna talk about going through the valley of, of tears. I haven't been through the Valley of Tears. I have, though, been through the Valley of Dissertation. Um, for those of you who don't know or care, if you're fortunate if you don't know or care um, about dissertations, this is the 175-page paper I had to write before I graduated with my PhD. And because I'm in the field of psychology, I, I had to actually do psychological research on people that ended up in this, um, in this document. My, I, I do research on um, pastoral wellness. I now lead a research team who focuses on that, and I love that, but this was sort of my initial foray into that. And um, so anybody who's done a dissertation will tell you it's, it's a nightmare. Um, it's just a lot, a lot, a lot of work over a lot of time, and it's a lot of patience, which I have none of. I just don't have any patience, right? Um, so, but anyway, I was in this online program, but in the online program, we had to go twice for what they called residencies. So I'd have to fly out there, be on campus for a full week, and we would be in this little classroom, and from the very beginning of the day till dinner, we would work on our dissertations, and we'd go to dinner, and then we'd go back to our rooms and work on our dissertations until we just dropped in bed exhausted, and then get up the next morning and work on our dissertations some more. That was kind of like what it was like. So it was grueling, really. Um, and probably at my second residency, I probably had 25 pages of this written, and, and it wouldn't even look like the first 25 pages of this because it got edited so much over time. But um, So I'm, I'm struggling, to be honest with you, with the fact that I have so far to go. When I go to this thing, it's just right in my face that I have so far to go to finish this. And they bring a lady in to talk to us one of the days of the week who was like basically done to inspire us. <laughs> I think that's what their goal was anyway. Um, and she came in and she, she had done everything. She had defended. The only thing that was left was for her to get the dean's signature. Now at the school where I was at, the dean's signature was the final, so let it be written, so let it be done. When that's done, you have your doctorate, your doctor so-and-so. Up until that time, any of this is subject to change. If the dean wants it changed, then you may have to go back. And so it's a big deal. Getting the dean's signature was a big deal. So she was telling us that's all she had left, you know. And um, then suddenly I see the dean pop up at the door and realize this was a setup. The school set it up for her to come in and talk to us. And now he's going to come in and sign her dissertation, which he did, right? Um, and that was a great moment for her, you know. Um, <laughs> The rest of us are staring at our computer screens with that blinking cursor and realizing how many pages have left to get written. And there's that moment, you know how it comes out when you say, I'm so happy for you, you know? It's, it's very hard to say it and have it mean something, you know? Um, 
But do you know that divided feeling that you really are happy for them? Of course you're happy for them. But then it's like, but I have so far to go, I'm not there yet. By the way, I had to steal this out of my dad's office. My, when, when I finished my dissertation, they said, does anybody want a nice fancy bound copy of it? My dad said, yes, I do. And I said, I never want to see that doc- document for the rest of my life. So I had to go get it out of his office. But for some of you, um, this illustration would be more like that bell that you ring, right? So, so for those of you who get orthodontia work done, um, often when you get the braces off for the final time, you ring the bell when you're done. Or people, that's often something that's done in chemo or radiation. You ring the bell in your final treatment. And every, that should never stop. It's a wonderful thing to do. And I think it's, it's a great motivator and there's a great psychological benefit to it. But can we just all be real about the fact that when you hear someone else ring the bell, there's that part of you that goes, I'm so happy for them. But then there's the other part that goes, I wish it was me. I wish it was me. So that's the question of this talk is how do you find happiness when Jeremiah 29, 11 seems to be coming true for other people, but not yet for you? So you're like, I know, yeah, yeah, I know God has a plan and I know he has a future for me, but it feels like it's a million miles away and it feels like other people are getting there. Just like the the people who got to Jerusalem first, they're getting there, but there were others who were really in the middle of the battle to get there and it's like, how do you deal with that? We're gonna go to Psalm 84 and we're gonna camp out there for a little bit. So if you have your reading device or if you have your Bible and you wanna camp out somewhere, Psalm 84 wouldn't be a bad place. The psalmist here is not David. David's been dead for a little while. This is another psalmist who's writing about these two groups of people, the group of people that is there in Jerusalem and the people that are trying to get there. So the first verse, Psalm 84, 4, says this, blessed or generally happy are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. So this is about the people that have made it to Judah, made it to Jerusalem, and however much of the temple had been rebuilt at this point, may not have been completely rebuilt, but however much of it's been rebuilt, they're worshiping in the temple. They're having the experience that their family has dreamed of for seven decades. And so we're not surprised that the psalmist says, hey, they're happy. Of course they're happy. They're there. They are through. They've made it through that journey to to finally get out of captivity and get home. But then we would expect him to say, but, you know, sad are the people that are still trying to make it there. But he doesn't say that. He says, also generally happy or blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. What does it mean to have your heart set on pilgrimage? He's saying their hearts are set on getting through. They're not through yet, but their hearts are set on getting through. They haven't arrived, but their heart is set on arriving. What does it mean to have your heart set on something? You remember that from when you were a kid, you had your heart set on something for Christmas and somebody gave you a sweater, you know? (laughs) To have your heart set on something means I don't want anything less than this. Like, this is what I'm going for. This is the thing. This this, This is what I'm aiming at and this is what I will continue to push for. Paul would call it the prize. He said, I continue to press toward the prize. There's that thing that we set our heart on that says it's gotta be this right? And the psalmist is saying, generally happy are the people whose heart is set on getting there. They may not be there yet, but their heart is set on getting there. I'm talking to somebody in this room. You're in the middle of a, of a, of a difficult, difficult valley season of your life, but you know what I'm talking about because your heart is set on getting there and it's a motivator. Medical professionals tell us that there's something about internal motivation that is, that is a, a form of life support in and of itself, that it's interesting that people who have a substantial will to live will often thrive and thrive and thrive, but then if something happens and they lose their will to live, often maybe they'll just have a few days left. There's something very, very important about having our heart set on getting there. He says this about those people whose heart are set on a pilgrimage. He says, as they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs, and the autumn rains also cover it with pools. Okay, what is the valley of Baca? It's a valley that people had to go through on the way to Jerusalem. We think we know which one it was. Um, And the reason we think we know which one it was, this Valley of Baca thing is also translated, your your version of the Bible may say the Valley of Weeping. And the reason it was called the Valley of Weeping is because it was populated very densely with these, uh, dense may be a a bit much. It It was populated with a lot of Middle Eastern balsam trees, a very specific kind of balsam tree that grows in that area uh, of the Middle East. And the interesting thing about these balsam trees, if something should happen to cause the bark to crack, or if you were to take a knife and slice open the bark, I, I guess it's sap that comes out. The sap that comes out, the way that it comes out, it looks just like human tears. It's freakish how much it looks like it. So it looks as though the trees are weeping, so they get called weeping trees. And so this valley is very populated with these weeping trees and then would become known as the weeping valley. Now here's what's interesting about that. There's, there's both that mention of the trees there, but there's another metaphor there because these trees only grow in very, very dry environments. 
They're very difficult and treacherous for, for people in the ancient world to travel through environments that were that dry. So the other part of weeping is that it was a very difficult thing for people to go through. See, we, we, it's very hard for us to think about what it was like to travel in the ancient world. You know, we're, we're used to just load up the SUV and hit a few McDonald's on the way. We'll be fine, you know? In the ancient world, you really had to think through every little part of the journey and how dangerous those different parts might be. And the Valley of Baca was a dangerous place because they're just, they're, it was dry and it was barren and you were gonna have to just somehow make it through. The Bible says that as they would pass through that valley, they would make it a place of springs. And my favorite Bible experts say that basically this means they would dig a well. They would dig a series of wells. So as they would go through this incredibly dry place, and here's what I love, they anticipate the provision of God. There's something about a person who's going through a valley but anticipates the provision of God. That person who says, I know it seems dry, but there's water here somewhere. I better get a shovel. That's faith. Faith is, I'm in this valley and it's really, really dry, but I'm gonna get a shovel because I know God loves me and there's water here somewhere. And that's what the Bible's saying. They go through this valley, but they start digging and when they dig, they hit, they hit water. They make it a place of springs. And here's the other thing that's cool. It says the autumn rains also cover it with pools. What does that mean? Well, the autumn rains would, would dissipate so quickly because it was flat and it was dry that the rains would happen, but there was no basin to collect the rain and so it would just run off and it would be wasted. But now that these people are digging wells, as the rain would come in, there would be a place for the rain to be collected. And so not only was water coming from below, but water was coming from above. I'm talking to somebody in this room who's saying, I'm in a valley, but God is blessing me from below and from above and I don't understand it, but it's probably because you were willing to get a shovel and dig a well because you knew God had something for you in this valley. You knew God was going to do something. The Bible says they go from strength to strength, which we'll talk about in a minute, till each appears before God in Zion. And here Zion is just a, a word to refer to Jerusalem. And God's saying they're all going to get there, but they're going to have to do it strength to strength. And they're going to have to have their heart set on getting through. Now, why was going through a valley a big deal? Well, if we're right about, if Bible scholars are right about which specific valley we're talking about, there are a few things that were made it very hard. One is it had very limited visibility. The way the topography was, you really couldn't see very far in front of you. You might be able to see today's journey and just a little bit of tomorrow's. But other than that, you're not gonna be able to see anything more. I'm talking to somebody in this room right now, maybe because of your medical situation or because of a family situation or something going on in your marriage, something going on financially. You're like, yeah, that's me. I can see today's steps and I can see a few steps of tomorrow, but past that, I have no idea. That's valley living. And that's what these folks were going through as they were going through this valley. The second thing is it was an endurance challenge because this is, this is kind of weird the way I'll, I'll describe it, but because the, the way the valley is, is set up, when the sun would come up in the, in the hottest part of the day, you would just get baked. I mean, you just get beat down by the sun. And I guess the weird part that I was gonna say is we understand in Kansas what it's like to not have wind breaks, right? We don't, we don't have any kind of, of land formation that causes the wind to stop. So that's why everything is so crazy windy. We get all those winds. But isn't it true that on a hot day, right, the breezes are kind of nice? it's actually kind of nice to get a little bit of a breeze because it's very difficult to be in a very hot day where, where no air is moving. That's what it was like to be in this valley. The, the wind was broken on both sides. So you're getting the beat down from the sun, but none of the breezes. And I wonder who I'm talking to in this room that you're getting the beat down, but you're not getting the breezes. You're like, I'm getting the rough time, that's for sure, but I'm not getting any of the things that make it easier for other people. It's just, it's full on, like I, I, I'm getting the whole battle but I'm not getting any of the breaks. And then the last thing is it was monotonous. Just the same thing over and over again. The whole journey, you see the same thing. Wendy and I used to live in Oklahoma City and all our family were here, so we would travel from Oklahoma City to Wichita and Wichita to Oklahoma City and Oklahoma City to Wichita. Nobody writes books about the scenery between Oklahoma City and Wichita. <laughs> Just the same thing over and over again. And you get exhausted, don't you? When you deal with something that's the same thing over and over again, isn't it true that we get exhausted? And some of us, that's where we're at. We're like, God, I'm so exhausted because it's just the same thing over and over again. So if that's where you're at, you're like, God, I have limited visibility. I can't see very far in front of me. This is an endurance challenge. I'm really feeling like I'm not getting any breaks here. And then on top of that, it just feels like it's the same thing over and over again. If that's you, our scripture really encourages us that there are two ways you can deal with your valley. 
And all of us are gonna go through a valley. But there are two ways you can deal with it. The first is you can make that valley your identity. And I think a lot of people make that choice. As a matter of fact, I think that's kind of the default choice. You ever met somebody who's, the only thing they can ever talk about is the valley they've been through. And the truth is, now, technically, they're out of that valley. But that valley now is so absorbing to them that it's all they can talk about, it's all they can think about, it's still their, their life story. It's not something that impacted their life, it now is their life. Your second choice is to make it your ministry, to make the valley your ministry. Those are two very different choices. And, and really, I think that's, that's what the psalmist is trying to tell us. Listen, people who make the valley their identity say, God, what are you trying to do to me? And people that make the valley their ministry say, God, what are you trying to do through me? Look, I, I know I, I, if, I had, if, I, if I had my preference, I wouldn't be in this valley right now. But you have me here, and I know that my story isn't on pause just because just I'm in this valley. My, my ministry, my purpose, my calling isn't on pause just because I'm in this valley. You have something for me. And that's the power of, of making it your ministry. On the idea of making it your identity, which like I said, I think is very, very common. I, I think it's one of the key pathways to, to dealing with depression. When, when I talk to colleagues and people who study depression, we talk a lot about the negative triad. Doesn't that bless you? Does that sound exciting? The negative triad. Um, but this is, this is kind of my version of it, slightly different than what you'll see online. But the negative triad is that a person who struggles with depression, certainly major depressive disorder, tends to have pervasive negative thoughts about myself, my situation, and my future. I, feel, I, I think negatively about me. I think negatively about the world around me. And I think very negatively about what's to come, right? Which, by the way, this kind of sounds like this. Myself, this is who I am. So this valley that I'm in, it now is my, is my identity, my life. This is who I am. You wanna know who I am? I'm that guy who got divorced. You wanna know who I am? I'm that lady who had to file for, for, for bankruptcy. That is who I am. That's my identity. This is who I am. My situation, this is how life works for me. And we start talking about luck and fate and how that we always somehow come up at the bottom of the stack and everybody else does better than us. And then my future is this will never change. I'm stuck here. And you've probably heard all these things from people that you've talked to over the years. This is the, this is the word track for letting your valley become your identity. And it's, it's a risky thing to do. There's a story in the scripture about uh, a woman named Naomi. You can read her story in the book of Ruth. The book is mostly about her daughter-in-law, but at the beginning you read a little bit about Naomi. Naomi and her husband were living in Moab, away from, from their homeland, away from Israel. And um, she and her husband had two sons. Their two sons married Moabite women and, and uh, had a, a good life. But then suddenly some sickness went through their family. Naomi's husband died. That's a terrible thing. In doing grief share, I've worked with many people who've lost a spouse. It's just, I can't even imagine the kind of grief that that causes. But then it wasn't just that. Later on, Naomi's two sons died. No parent should have to bury a child. And she's now gone through this. And now it's just her and two daughters-in-law. And she says to her daughters-in-law, look, you guys need to stay here in Moab. This is where your home is. I'm gonna go home to, to Israel. And one of the daughters-in-law didn't wanna go, but she reluctantly decided to stay, or to stay in Moab. The other one, Ruth said, there's no way I'm leaving you. Wherever you go, I'm gonna go. It's a beautiful story. And so Ruth and Naomi make their way back to Israel. And as they make their way back, people recognize Naomi and run out to her. I'm assuming to support her. Have you ever seen somebody ruin the opportunity to be supported? That's what you're gonna see with, with Naomi. She says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, which means bitter, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. If you let your valley become your identity, your low point will become your label. She's like, just call me bitter. You ever met somebody like that? I've been through something that was a bitter experience, so now I have a right to be a bitter person, and that's who I'm gonna be. I've been through something unfair, so now I'm gonna be an angry person, deal with it. I've been through some low moments, so I have a right to act like the world owes me something. And we begin to let that low point become that name tag that we put on ourselves and say, this is who I am. Fortunately for Naomi, God orchestrated a wonderful, a, a wonderful grouping of events that changed her life forever, but I think that's not always the case. I think there are people who literally label themselves for the rest of their life based off of a temporary valley. 
And we can't afford to do that. The second thing is, if you let your valley become your identity, you will become defensive about accepting defeat. See, the thing about it is, you can always take a next step in a valley. See, the thing that frustrates us is that we can't get through today. We wanna get through today. And I told you, I'm an impatient person. That's what I want. If I'm in a valley, I wanna get done right now. Like, I've talked to people like that as doing grief ministry these days. They're like, give me the steps. I, if I do the steps, I think I can get through this grieving thing in three or four weeks. Doesn't work that way. You can't dictate when you will get through, but you can make the choice to make the next step. But what happens is, once our valley becomes our identity, we get demotivated and we say, I'm not gonna take any more steps. This is just where I live now. I'm not gonna take, but the problem is then people will come to you and well-meaning, wanting to help you say, well, why don't you take this step? Or why don't you take this step? And then what do we do? We get mad because we've made the determination that this is where I live now. Don't try to move me off of this. Don't try to tell me what steps I should take because this is where I live now. And we respond negatively to the one thing that could help us. Children of Israel did that. They did that all the time. Constantly telling Moses, man, if we'd only died in Egypt, this is our valley, we wanna stay here. Don't try, to push, don't, don't try to push us off of this. I know nobody in this room would ever want a valley that you go through to be your identity, but how do you make the valley your ministry? If that's the other choice, if that's the thing that God has called us to do, if that's how we find happiness in the middle of a really difficult season, how do we do that? The Bible says as they pass through the Valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. When, when, when I think about that, I think about when I drive home every day, I, I drive past a, a little building that has a sign in front of it that says Bridget's Cradles. You may or may not be familiar with this, with this organization, but um, sweet Christian young couple in our city went through the loss of, a, of an infant. They, their first child was born at, I think, 25 weeks, and she was still born. Um, it was just a very, very very, very difficult time for that family. And the pregnancy, had been, the pregnancy had been difficult and there were a lot of reasons to believe that there was a lot of risk. Even if the baby had been born alive, there was a lot of risk that the baby wouldn't survive. And family was trying to just think about how they could support each other and, and, and in their faith together. Um, Ashley's mom, the grandma of the baby, began to crochet a, a little blanket because this was gonna be a little baby when this baby was born. Everybody knew this was gonna be a tiny little baby. She began to crochet a little blanket. But as she crocheted it, she thought, I'm not sure that it's gonna to work to be able to swaddle the baby in this, in this blanket. So she, she tried to think of what she could do with it. And so what she did was she, she knitted up the side, crocheted up the sides and, and put a little lace around the side and created this tiny little cradle. Looks like a little, little tiny crocheted boat almost, little, little cradle for the, for the baby. And when the baby was stillborn, the, the hospital staff came and gingerly brought this beautiful little baby to her parents. But she was brought in these sort of bulky hospital blankets and they couldn't feel the baby, they couldn't feel her weight and, and feel her features. And so um, the grandma remembered, I have that, that cradle. She went and got it out of her bag and they put this, this little baby in this tiny little cradle and it, it was something that brought them a lot of peace. There, there was a little cross attached to the to the front of the cradle, and it meant so much to them, and, and it became something that they, they began to, to do as a ministry for other people that were going through a similar situation. One of the ways that the grandma of this precious baby really dealt with her grief was crocheting more of these for other people, and then it got picked up on the news, and then it got picked up on the national news, and now they're an organization that has sent cradles to, and if I misquote this number, I, I feel terrible about it, but I'm pretty sure from last, what I read last, they've sent cradles to a 1,000 hospitals across the United States, each with a little cross on it, because their faith is so integrated into what their mission is. That's what we're talking about with digging a well. See, it wasn't even like they started off to do something for everybody else. And digging a well in the valley isn't even something you start to do for everybody else. It's something you do because you anticipate God's provision for you. And you remember we said last week, God will orchestrate, but you have to cooperate. I'm cooperating with the provision that I know God has for me in this situation, and I'm just taking the next step. Whatever the next step is, I'm gonna just do that. But it's interesting that as you take the next step and God provides, it then becomes something that grows and it becomes beneficial for other people. And that's the first point that I wanna make here is that if you let your valley become your ministry, you'll experience God's provision and you'll leave a blessing for others. There were people that would worship in Jerusalem knowing that the wells that they dug in the valley were still there for people who were on their way to Jerusalem. 
I wanna live a life, here's the deal. There are so many things that we wanna do to leave a legacy. I, I read a study the other day about what Americans wanna do to leave a legacy, and so many of those things have to do with money, and so many of those things, I mean, it's, it's kind of all over the page. People say they wanna leave collections to family members. Honestly, the biggest legacy that you and I can leave is to dig wells for those who will come through the valley after us, so that they will have something to sustain them. Secondly, if you, by the way, can I just, can I go off script for just a quick second? Because I feel the Lord has really led me to say this today. And I said it to the last service as well. But thinking about the Bridget's Cradle story, and I'm, I'm a little off topic here. But folks, in New Spring, we believe that when a child is conceived, it is a human being. And we believe that that human being, when that, when that little child dies in the hospital, or when, the, when a, a person suffers a miscarriage, when a couple suffers, suffers a miscarriage, there is a child, and that child is at home safe in the arms of the Lord. And can I just say, I've never said this from the pulpit before, but I'm gonna say it right now. Can I just say that the Christian community, community ought to be the first to say, please never, ever, 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 ever minimize the tragedy of a miscarriage, ever, 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 ever. That is the loss of a child. Now, our culture is, concerned, our culture is convinced that, that it's not a child, it's a fetus, because we want to determine what we want to call it. But I'm telling you, the moment that that child is conceived, it is a child, and when, it, and, and when that child is miscarried, that child has a name, God knows that child, and that child is safe in the arms of Jesus. But we also need to partner, we need to come around those couples as the body of Christ and, and mourn with them the same way, same way we would mourn any other loss. Folks, we've gotta get this right. It's not right yet in the Church of Jesus Christ, and we've gotta get it right. So forgive me for going off script for just a minute. Second thing is, if you let your valley become your ministry, you will get stronger step by step. This is a promise in the scripture. Check this out. They go from strength to strength. This is an important concept in scripture. You'll also find it in the Pauline epistles that God has created a situation for us where if we take a step, God will make us stronger. Every time we take a step, God makes us stronger. Why is that so important? Because it is so common in the middle of the valley to think, I'm not strong enough to get through this. Here's the truth, you're right. You're not strong enough to get through this. Probably not today. The point is, God is saying, you don't have to be strong enough to get through this, you just have to be strong enough to take the next step. And as you take the next step, God is gonna make you stronger. And you take the next step and God is gonna make you stronger. And some of us could tell the story of that and we could also say that a lot of times those steps were teeny tiny baby steps, because that's all we could do. But when we made that teeny tiny baby step, God continued to make us stronger. Finally, if you let your valley become your ministry, you will make it through. God is not into redundancy. There's a reason why the scripture says they go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Here Zion is a reference to Jerusalem, but Zion also has meaning in scripture often of heaven. Isn't that meaningful for us as Christians to say, you know, in a sense, this world that I'm going through is its own valley. I have steep valleys sometimes, but all of the journey of, human, of being a human being has its challenges. But if I take it a step at a time, there's gonna come a day where I'm gonna face Jesus Christ and I'm gonna thank him for everything that he did for me and I will have made it through. And I say that because some, somebody might be listening to this message and say, Jonathan, you don't understand. I have metastasized cancer. I'm, I'm, I've done every treatment. I could be talking to somebody right now online who's in hospice, who's in a hospice bed watching this saying, I, I know that I only have a few days left to live and my answer to you is you're almost there. You're almost there. Listen, there's a lot wrong with this body already. At 41, there's a lot wrong with this body already. And true healing is heaven. Some of us have the idea that all healing happens on earth. Now, let me tell you what, the ultimate healing happens when we step into the presence of Jesus Christ. So how do you deal with it when other people are getting there and you're not getting there yet? Well, this may not be exactly the answer you're looking for, but hopefully it'll be an answer that can sustain you through this. We need to remember that this is not about a race to the finish line. This is about reaching the finish line. There's two different things. Roy Angel, famous pastor, decades and decades ago, used to tell a story, and I'll, I'll close with this. But he used to tell a story of a... Uh, athletic competition, colleges from all over the country meeting for this tournament, track tournament, where they were all gonna compete in these track events and, and um, end of year tournament kind of thing. And there was the, the one mile race. They'd set it up and the whole, 
lineup there of these incredibly built athletes getting ready to go run this, this mile race. And, but there was one thing kind of out of place. In the middle of this huge line of, of exceptionally talented athletic runners, there was a scrawny kid that looked like he totally didn't belong there. But you know how it is. You think, well, maybe he's just really, really good, you know? But then the, the, the starting gun sounded and everybody realized, no, he's not good, you know? Every, everybody else just taken off and this, this kid's coughing and wheezing as he's going down the track and he's just way behind everybody else. And, and the race doesn't take all that long. You, then you have the, the first place runner goes through, second place runner, third place runner, a few more people cross the finish line just for good measure. But then the rest of the runners, they start to just sort of clear the track and they realize they're not gonna win. They get off the track and take their number off. And, so the managers of the, of the event start to put hurdles out on the track for the next event. And you hear over the PA system, they say, hey, get those hurdles off the track. There's still a runner out there. And it's this scrawny kid still out there running, trying to run the mile, right? And taking forever. And, and people are starting to take bets on whether or not this kid is gonna die before he reaches the finish line, you know? Because he just doesn't look like he's got it in him. And he finally does hit the finish line, kind of collapses on the other side. One of the coaches from one of the other colleges was nearby, runs over to just make sure this kid is okay. And he says, son, are you all right? And he says, yes, sir, I am. And he said, I don't, I don't get it. You know the race has been over for a while. And he said, yeah, I know. And he said, well, you know you have no chance of placing in this race. He said, yeah, I know that too. He said, well, didn't you see the other runners? They were just clearing off the, off the track. You know you can do that. They just cleared off the track. He said, yeah, I saw that. He said, well, I don't understand. He said, well, coach, here's the deal. You know, this is a, a tournament where you have to field a, 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 an athlete in every single event or you can't compete. And he said, we have a really good runner, sir, one of the best. But he got real sick this morning. And the coach asked me if I would run in his place. I'm the manager, you know. <laughs> he's, he's like, I carry bottles of Gatorade and towels. And, but you know, the coach asked me, so I said, sure. And he said, well, that's, that's really noble, son. I mean, that's, that's really, you know, in, you know admirable, but um, why, why didn't you quit when all the others quit? And he said, you know, my coach didn't send me in to win. He sent me in to run the mile. And I ran the mile. See, if you're like me, impatience is part of your life. I hope not to the extent that it is in mine. But impatience says, I gotta win this race. I gotta get there. But remember what we said about faith? Faith is the confidence that I will get there. And it impacts my life. It impacts what I say, what I do, what I think. And when others look at me, they know I'm going through a valley, but they say, there's something about that person. And we can say, look, I don't have to win this race. I just have to run the mile. That's what my coach sent me in to do, and that's what I'm gonna do. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you so much for this group of people that are here today. And for the fact that even when we're in a valley, as, as, as David said, even when we go through the darkest valley of our life, we don't have to fear evil because you are with us. We have a relationship in the middle of the valley that we can always lean into. And Father, now I specifically pray for those in this room that are in a deep, dark valley, that when they go home today, they're gonna be right back in the stress and the difficulty and the pain that they've been in all week and that they may be in in the week to come. And Father, I pray that you would give them the provision that they need, that you would help them to dig those wells so that this can be a ministry for them and not an identity. Help them to see that you love them tremendously and that you will never leave them in the middle of this valley. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for being here with us this week.